Um, thanks, Yes and, and Savannah for having me. Um, it's a pleasure, and um, we look forward to doing some going over some core dermatology topics um, in a format that you'll be familiar with from some of these previous lectures. Um, so we're going to go through um, ten really core uh, core topics in dermatology, and we're not going to be covering erythema nodosum or erythema multiforme um, as they have been uh, reviewed previously in the rheumatology lecture. Another thing I want to say is thanks to Yezin for helping put together these slides. Um, clearly you guys do a lot, of, a lot of work behind the scenes and um, yeah, really appreciate that. All right, so first question, guys. Um, so read through it and then um, uh, stick your answer in the poll and we'll go through it. So 20 seconds left. Ten seconds. Right, guys, excellent. Yeah, D, D is the correct answer. Um, so this is clearly a, a case of psoriasis, uh, chronic plaque psoriasis. Um, um, yeah, so um, the rash here has been present for three months and um, it has the kind of characteristic, uh, well demarcated, uh, the raised erythematous plaques, uh, well known to be uh, a feature of psoriasis. Um, it's on the extensive surfaces, the knees, um, and another clue is that this patient's been on lithium, which is a known trigger for psoriasis. And um, we'll come on to these, some of these triggers uh, on the next slide. Um, so the reasoning behind this answer, um, so combination therapy and psoriasis has been proven to be more effective than monotherapy. Um, so corticosteroids um, will improve psoriasis through anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive mechanisms, whereas the vitamin B agents will work through uh, reduction in keratinocyte proliferation, which is one of the features of, of psoriasis. Um, and they've got their own inherent anti-inflammatory properties as well. So working together, um, they are, it's a more favorable approach. Um, and we favor the potent topical steroid over the very potent um, steroid. Um, because in this case, the rash is only affecting the knees rather than a widespread sort of florid psoriasis. Um, and so with a very potent topical corticosteroid, you've got a higher side effect profile and you risk causing unwanted immunosuppression, like, like more severe immunosuppression. Um, it can cause skin thinning uh, and so on. So as the best first step, you want to go for a potent topical steroid over a very potent. Um, so let's just now go over some of the key features of psoriasis. So it's a chronic inflammatory condition um, of keratinocyte hyperproliferation. A bit of a mouthful there, but keratinocytes lie in your epidermis and they produce keratin. Um, so then they hyperproliferate, you get lots of these extra um, skin cells, and, and you get these well circumscribed um, red scaly plaques, typically on the extensive surfaces, so the back of the elbows, um, the knees, typically the front of the knees. Um, and you get this overlying silvery scale. Um, and you get this. Alongside psoriasis, you have an increased risk of developing other inflammatory diseases such as psoriatic arthritis and Crohn's disease. Um, and um, it's super common, affecting sort of 1 in 50 people, 2% of the, of the population. Um, something you should all know about is um, called the Kerbner phenomenon. And this is where new psoriasis occurs at sites of cutaneous trauma. So for example, if someone scratches their skin, so with a nail or, or, or through an injury, or even after surgery, you can get new psoriasis developing um, at that site of trauma. And this is the curve phenomenon. When you've got a patient with these, uh, these 
this kind of characteristic rash, you might consider some other differentials, for example, tinea, fungal infection, which also have a bit of flaking in scale. Um, although typically you find that more on the trunk or in the groin or, the, or those kind of areas where fungi like to breathe um, rather than on the elbows and the knees. Um, eczema, um, eczema doesn't typically have plaques, but you might consider it as a differential. Lichen planus and pityriasis rosea, we're going to talk about a bit later, but you might also consider these as um, on, on your differential. Um, so I'm just getting a note saying that audio is not great. Can you hear okay? Everyone able to hear me all right? Um, so vitamin D, um, I'm getting a question here. Um, vitamin D helps by, um, it, it reduces um, the keratinocyte proliferation. Um, so the steroids reduce the inflammation and the vitamin D analog helps with reducing the keratinocyte proliferation. Um, and also it does have some of its own anti-inflammatory properties as well. Um, so the Kerner phenomenon, yeah, so it's usually, um, it's usually just at the site of injury. Um, the underlying mechanism, uh, I'm, I'm not too sure actually, I think it's a, 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 complex, uh, a complex process actually, um, so I'm not 100% sure about that. Right, so triggers for psoriasis. Um, we've mentioned the Kerner phenomenon, which is skin trauma. Um, infections can cause uh, or trigger psoriasis as well, such as streptococcus. And you'll see on the image on the right here, we've got a young patient who has um, sort of these widespread diffuse um, sort of uh, discoid uh, round lesions with a spine scale on the top. Um, and this is classic for guttate psoriasis, um, or you know, the raindrop um, appearances of, of these lesions. Um, and this can be um, a secondary uh, effect following strep throat, streptococcal pharyngitis. And so that's an important association to know about. Um, HIV uh, infection can also trigger uh, psoriasis. Um, drugs, there are many drug causes. Um, a helpful mnemonic is barley, so beta blockers, anti-malarials, lithium, as well as NSAIDs such as indomethacin. Um, withdrawal of steroids um, is an interesting one. So um, one of the reasons why we don't use oral corticosteroids in psoriasis um, is that typically if you start them in a patient, they might um, get an initial improvement in their psoriasis. Um, but then when you stop the, uh, stop the steroids, then they get a flare of the psoriasis, which can be actually worse than the initial presentation. Um, so withdrawal of steroids is an important uh, trigger for psoriasis. Um, stress, alcohol, and smoking are all important too. Um, and um, sunlight usually improves psoriasis actually, but in uh, about 10% of cases, it can make it worse. Um, so, um, so group A uh, streptococcus, typically the group A, uh, the, uh, group A hemolytic strep typically triggers psoriasis, as far as I remember. Um, so treatment of psoriasis, and I'll spend a bit of time here just because um, uh, I think it's important to just know a bit about why we use these certain treatments. Um, First of all, um, with any sort of uh, chronic condition, um, you want to address the lifestyle issues early on. Um, so smoking cessation, reduction in alcohol consumption, um, and weight loss, all, all very important. Um, and smoking and obesity in particular are associated with poorer responsive treatment in psoriasis. Um, and reducing weight will help a myriad of things anyway. Um, but with psoriasis, you are at increased risk of cardiovascular complications. So by reducing your weight, um, you help both psoriasis and you reduce your cardio risk factors. The lifestyle issue is very important. Um, avoiding irritants is also uh, very important. Um, and much of this will be guided by your, your history, uh, working out what triggers the psoriasis for the patient. Um, so Substitutes are very important. So soap dries out the skin, um, which you obviously don't want in an already dry, dry condition. Um, so it can worsen psoriasis as well as conditions like eczema. And um, so soap substitutes are key. Um, and Dermal 500 is a pretty good one. Um, aqueous cream, um, it can be used as a soap substitute, 
that's not usually a first choice because um, when you leave aqueous cream on the skin, it can, it can break down the barrier of the skin and cause a bit of local irritation. So it's not normally the first, first choice, but it can be used. Uh, emollients work by moisturizing the skin, uh, reducing scale and itching, um, and they allow other topical treatments to penetrate through and work more effectively. Um, so I'd suggest sort of learning a couple of these. So Dermal 500 and Diprobase are, are good to, to learn. Um, the mainstay of psoriasis treatment is, is topical steroids, to be honest. And um, you know, these come in a variety of strengths, which we'll come on to shortly. Um, and you can also use vitamin D3 analogs, such as uh, calcifer trial. Um, Dithranol is a cream that can sometimes be used for psoriasis. Um, and this really works down by slowing down the process of skin cell production. Um, cold tar is an old historic treatment, it's still sometimes used. Um, and just be aware that both of these, um, they cause staining of the skin and they stain the patient's clothes and the bed sheets. So do, do let them know about this. Um, phototherapy um, is typically used when topical treatments aren't working. Uh, it's essentially UV light uh, developed in a, uh, delivered in a controlled way. Um, patients will attend you know, two or three times a week or up to about 10 weeks. And it can be UVB light or UVA. Um, and the P that has a poover, that's called sorolin, like a P at the beginning of that, just like psoriasis. And this sorolin, um, you can take it as a tablet or you can put it on the skin, um, and it sensitizes the skin um, so that the UVA um, is more effective. So I'm just getting a few questions here. Um, yeah, so methotrexate, um, sometimes can be introduced early, yes. Um, this would be in situations where the other treatments are contraindicated. So for example, they can't have steroids for, for whatever reason, um, or phototherapy might be contraindicated. Um, sometimes you might start with something like methotrexate and start with a low dose and titrate that. Um, other systemic um, treatments you can use includes acetretin, um, and this is a retinoid, a vitamin A derivative. And the important thing to note about all of these are that they are teratogenic. Um, so you mustn't use them with somebody who's pregnant um, and you must sort of alert um, women of childbearing age um, that you know, they, they can't take these uh, medications and they must uh, use good contraception. Um, I'm not sure um, how long they take to be cleared from the body, but I think it depends on if you're using a topical retinoid or which has less of a systemic absorption or an oral retinoid and which will have obviously more, more systemic absorption. So if it's something like um, Broacutane for acne, which we'll talk about later, that's a very powerful retinoid. Uh, that takes a few months uh, before you can then um, start you know, conceiving um, after that's come out of the body. Um, cyclosporin is another immunosuppressive medication that can be used for, for uh, psoriasis. Um, and finally, sort of when all these treatments fail, you can, you can uh, use biologics. Um, and these are powerful uh, immunosuppressive medications. They do anti TNF alphas, such as Tanifer and then Cyclamab. And um, you can also use some of the newer uh, monoclonal antibodies, such as Ustekinumab can yield really incredible results. You might have a patient who has full body coverage, refractory to all these other treatments, and you start with the Kinemab, um, and then after a few months, they have almost total body clearance. And they're really amazing, uh, but they're not without their side effects. Um, so someone's asked, um, what patients are typically at higher risk of psoriasis? So psoriasis can run in families. There is a genetic component, uh, but certainly, um, an issue. Um, so I think a genetic uh, predisposition is, is one of the most important uh, risk factors for developing psoriasis. But, but anyone can get it. So let's talk a bit about topical steroid potency briefly. Um, so to start with, oh, firstly, the potency is determined by the amount of vasoconstriction that is produced as well as the degree to which the steroid inhibits inflammation. And so a common mild preparation would be hydrocortisone, 0.5% or 1%. Then we move on to moderate potency, which is Umivate, 
potent would be betnovate and very potent would be dermavate. And so whenever you're wondering or, or, or daydreaming about the potency of topical steroids, just imagine you want to help every budding dermatologist and you won't go wrong. Um, yeah, so this is a very good question here, just to ask when examining a patient, would you check scalp two for psoriasis? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, scalp psoriasis is common and it can be very uh, problematic and difficult to treat. Often you get um, quite a thick scale on the, on, on the scalp. Um, and what you want to do there is use an emollient that has something called salicylic acid in it. Um, and this salicylic acid can help break down the thick scale. Um, and then after you use that, then you can start applying things like steroids and, and other things to, uh, um, to really help um, penetrate the, um, the skin better. And in all dermatological examinations, check the hair as well. Need to remember. All right, guys, so we're going to move on from psoriasis. Um, here's the next question. Um. Is there 20 seconds left? And 10 seconds. Right, excellent. Yep. So the majority of people um, got the correct answer. By the way, some people have been putting questions. I accidentally clicked done, but um, we can come back to those um, at the end of the um, end of the lecture. Um, sorry, guys. So option B, yeah, option B is correct. Um, so um, this is essentially a case of a teenage boy presenting with a viral illness um, and an associated rash. Um, like the course of this rash is peculiar and it starts with an initial patch followed by a number of other patches which seem reasonably asymptomatic. Um, and this is classic for a condition called pityriasis rosea. Um, and the correct management for this is reassurance and discharge. Um, it's a self-limiting condition um, which rules out option A, C and D. Um, and reviewing a vaccination history um, is, is more useful when you're worried about conditions that can be vaccinated for, so for example, measles. Um, so it's, pityriasis is, is a common rash, commonly occurring after a viral illness, such as an upper respiratory tract infection. And you get this preceding herald patch, which is the first lesion to appear. Um, and it's a single, large, round um, erythematous patch. Um, and if you look a bit closer to this lesion, it's got this collarette or, or ring of scale um, just inside the edge of the lesion. Um, and then typically after a few days, um, you then get patches, smaller patches spread all over the trunk um, and across the back as well. And these patches look similar to this original herald patch, um, but often a bit smaller. Um, and these lesions are classically distributed across the trunk in a Christmas tree pattern. And typically this is on the back. Um, a, a quick note about these terms, herald, patch and Christmas tree pattern, they usually restrict themselves to textbooks and, and examination questions. So, you know, if you're in a clinic seeing a patient with what looks like pityriasis rosea, even if you want to impress the, the consultant, sort of try and avoid explaining that they look like a Christmas tree because it might raise a few eyebrows. Um, but certainly that is how it looks on the back at times. Um, so, it is, as I said, a self-limiting uh, and benign condition, so no treatment is required, so you can reassure, reassure both the patient and, and their parent uh, as well. Um, um, so a question, uh, how do we differentiate between pityriasis rosea and guttate psoriasis? 
um, both occur um, after infection and occur on the trunk and look similar. Um, so this is a, a good question. Um, so typically with psoriasis, um, you, you get quite an itchy rash. Uh, I think psoriasis is there can be itchy as well, but but the main feature with um, with a psoriatic type uh, lesion that it is um, more um, uh, it's more itchy. And also with um, gut ache psoriasis um, and psoriasis rosea, they have a, a, a different um, trajectory in the illness. So history is key. Um, so whilst on appearance, they might look a little bit similar, um, uh, the history is really important. So with psoriasis rosea, you'll get a classic history of a patch, one single patch starting on the trunk usually, um, and then multiple other small lesions starting. Whereas gut ache psoriasis, you'll get the sore throat and then a, um, a bit short while after you get um, multiple lesions across the trunk and uh, the trunk and back and typically with uh, gut ache psoriasis you get this scale that covers the whole lesion whereas the herald patch has this um, distinctive collarette um, uh, this a ring of, of scale which is a bit different so subtle differences but um, uh, there, there are some definitely there both the history and in, in appearance um, so differential diagnosis um, for this case, so this image here, this, this um, boy on the right, um, you might be thinking of things like, um, so obviously we mentioned psoriasis and gut ache psoriasis, but also um, you might think of tinea corporis, which is a fungal infection, um, uh, and that can also look similar to this, uh, and it's also itchy and has a bit of scale on it as well. Um, and remember guys, you can Further investigation is, is key here as well. You can take, um, if you're worried that it's a fungal infection, infection you can take swabs um, and send them to the lab and then that might grow um, fungal cultures and that might help um, elucidate, uh, elucidate this. Um, so this, this case um, is not tinea um, because of the history predominantly. Um, when you have the, uh, the sore throat followed by the herald patch and then um, these uh, smaller similar lesions spreading around the trunk. This is classical for psoriasis as well. Um, tinea wouldn't, wouldn't present usually in, in that manner. All right, so let's move on to the next question, if that's all right. Fifteen seconds left. Sorry, a bit delayed there. Ten seconds. Okay. Oh, guys. Right. So this is um, the underlying um, cause of this rash is likely to be atopic dermatitis. Um, so um, let's go through it. Um, this is essentially erythroderma. And um, uh, this is a, 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 you know, one of the few dermatological emergencies that you need to know. Um, uh, just looking through the question, um, the patient's tachycardic and hypotensive. So um, considering sepsis early is very important here. Um, however, as temperature is essentially normal, um, it's more likely that um, he's really dehydrated from lots of fluid loss um, due to the widespread um, fluid loss through through the um, affected skin and um, you'll be experiencing these hot and cold blushes and um, as we know one of the key functions of healthy skin um, is thermoregulation so why is it atopic dermatitis and not um, staphylococcal infection um, so staphylococcal infection or, or um, uh, staphylococcal scalded skin, um, that typically causes um, blistering of the skin. And we're actually going to come on to this a bit later, um, so I won't go into too much detail now. 
Um, but, um, but far more common is, um, is atopic dermatitis um, in this case. Um, so, um, uh, and, and staphylococcal infection, when you, um, when you have the fulminant uh, uh, staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, you, you might initially expect um, some yellow crust or something like that, um, which indicates some superficial staphylococcal infection. Um, which then follows through with um, the toxin being disseminated through the body. And the key feature there is you get blistering and sloughing of the skin, um, whereas here it's just pure erythema. And eczema and erythema go together hand in hand. And um, so that's why this is favoured in, 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 the, in the differential. Um, so erythroderma is, as I said, a dermatological emergency, um, and you get skin failure. 90% um, of the body surface area is affected, um, and it's got numerous causes. Um, for example, eczema, um, psoriasis. Um, drugs can cause it as well. For example, ACE inhibitors, um, antibiotics, including penicillins, um, anti-epileptics and anti-malarials. NSAIDs can also trigger erythroderma, um, and tricyclic antidepressants also, for example, amitriptyline. Um, about 30% of the causes are, 30% of cases, sorry, are idiopathic, so you won't get to the underlying diagnosis. Um, but most patients do have a pre-existing condition, um, such as eczema or psoriasis, so do ask them, because they might tell you, oh yeah, my eczema's been getting worse over the past couple of weeks, and suddenly they come in with this florid um, so, so that can be a clue to the underlying diagnosis. Um, and another thing to mention is that, just going back to the differential, why most people put stuff with a proper sort of skin, that typically doesn't have 90% plus body surface area affected. You don't usually get a Um And just another thing that I've just thought of why it is less likely to be staff is because staff with a proper sort of skin typically affects younger children, neonates, and, and, and young children generally. Um, here on the right, we can see a clearly erythrodermic patient um, with you know, uh, widespread um, erythema, um, with only a small amount of sparing and all just white, white axilla. So, so this is quite an unwell man. Management, um, you admit these patients um, and you take an aim to the approach, it's going to be quite sick usually. Um, and fluid resuscitation um, is very important. Um, you want to stop all non-essential systemic drugs. Sometimes they're going to be on a multi multitude of drugs. They might be on an ACE inhibitor and recently started with a penicillin. So you won't be sure what's triggered it. So it's better to stop all non-essential systemic drugs initially uh, before you speak to a, you know, a dermatologist about it. Um, as you've lost the skin barrier in a um, it's really important to um, coat the skin um, in something called 50-50, which is a white and liquid soft paraffin. It's like an emollient. Um, it's really, really greasy and thick. Um, and you want to absolutely lather the body in it, so cover them completely, um, because this will help uh, retain moisture um, and also um, heat as well. Um, remember to tell patients, though, that these paraffin-based emollients, such as 50-50, they carry a, they're, they're very flammable. So, what you really don't want is to be an A and E. You've done all the right stuff. You've cannulated them. You've, you've treated them well, but then they pop out for a cigarette, and then you get a call because your patient's outside A and E in a, in a ball of flames. Um, that that, that you know, won't be good for either the patient or, or you. So, um, so do um, remind patients of that, and remind their partners as well. Um, you can consider antibiotics for superimposed bacterial infection. And sometimes it's not going to be clear if it's sepsis or rhythm or, or what, because it might have raised inflammatory markers. Sometimes the CRT, CRT um, can be sky high in the white cells. Um, but sometimes they can be normal. You can have a fully erythrodermic patient with normal inflammatory markers. Um, so you won't be wrong for starting antibiotics in, in either situation, but um, consider broad spectrum oral or IV antibiotics, depending on, on, on how clinically they are. I mean, if they've got other signs of sepsis. Um, in terms of topical steroids, um, they are good to use in erythroderma, but the key point is that you want to use a moderate potency topical steroid, um, such as Umavit. Um, you don't want to go for um, one of the potent or, or, or very potent topical steroids, um, because you risk 
further immunosuppression, firstly. Um, but secondly, um, without uh, knowing what the underlying cause is, you might exacerbate their, their erythroderma. So for example, if it's psoriasis that's flared up and caused erythroderma, um, potent or very potent steroids will lead to uh, making, making the psoriasis and the erythroderma even worse, which you really want to avoid. So stick to moderate potency such as humor. Um, you want to also watch out for fluid loss um, and with that um, electrolyte disturbances, so check the user needs for sodium, potassium, etc., for renal function, um, and look out for hypothermia. Um, and you can use something called a bear hugger, which can warm the patient, and that's B-A-I-R, not, um, not bear as in a grizzly bear, and not bear as in bear man, you know, bear, um, B-A-I-R. Um, take swabs for bacteriology and virology, um, if you've got signs of superimposed infection on the skin, um, and you can consider doing a skin biopsy for um, trying to get to the bottom of why they are over the damage. Um, so I'll just have a look at some of these questions. And, uh, my lecturer taught me that erythroderma usually presents with fever. Is this common because this patient is not feverish though? Um, so they, they can present with fever, but sometimes they don't. Um, you know, they might be hot to the touch, um, like in this case, because you have widespread inflammation of the skin, which causes the skin to feel hot. Um, but they're not always fed well as such. It depends on the underlying cause and it depends on, you know, how unwell they are, um, really. Um, so you can, the next question, you can get mucosal involvement with erythroderma. How can you tell the difference between this and Stevens Johnson's CEF? This is a great question, um, and we're going to come on to this um, shortly. Um, but the short answer is, um, as far as I know, I'm not certain, I don't think you typically get a mucosal involvement with erythroderma. That's more a feature of, of um, Stephen Johnson syndrome and TEM. So just simply, uh, erythroderma, no, and Stephen Johnson TEM, yes. But you, you might need to um, look at that afterwards. Um, I'm going to move on a bit, guys, because there's a lot to get through. But we'll come back to some of these questions later. And some of them, uh, some of them you, you can look by going back to the earlier slide later. So this case, guys, I want you to just have a look at this guy. And in your own mind, just sort of look at this rash and try and describe it in, in, in your own words. What, what's going on here? Is this guy well? Is he unwell? What parts of the skin are involved? What do you think? So, essentially, this is a, a young man and he's got a widespread symmetrical rash um, with a poorly defined sort of erythematous macules and patches affecting his face, his upper torso, and you can see on his lips and his nose and his nostrils, that there's sort of hemorrhagic crusting and, and ulceration. So this is a, a certainly an unwell, uh, unwell gentleman. And this is Stevens Johnson syndrome. Um, something that you, you, know, you should all know about, and it's an, another dermatological emergency. Um, and this is a rare but severe exfoliative reaction. So this means the skin sort of peels away. Um, and um, it usually is a reaction to drugs. And then it usually has an onset of approximately two to three weeks from onset of starting the, um, the, the drug of, of interest. Um, and the acute phase of Stevens Johnson's and CEM usually lasts for about eight to 12 days. Um, and you get different, um, there's sort of ranges between severities. So with SJS, you typically have less than 10% body surface area involved. Then you can get an overlap of SJS and TEN, where 10 to 30% of body surface area is involved. Um, and with TEN, it's usually greater than 30% of body surface area. And the mortality rate is high, so 10% for SJS and more than 30% for TEN. So an easy way to remember that is the body surface area for SJS, 10%, mortality rate 10%, and TEN 30 and 30 as well. Um, something I want you to be aware of is the Nikolsky sign. So I'm not sure if you've heard of that, but that is where um, even light pressure on the skin um, can um, completely make the, the top layer of the skin slough off. So not very pleasant, um, but it can cause um, 
um, it loss of that epidermal layer um, and just even light touch um, will completely remove that surface of skin. It's been quite painful. Um, it's, um, as I said, mainly caused by drugs. So we'll go through a few. So sulfonamides, classically, so trimethoprim and cotrimoxazole, NSAIDs, uh, antibiotics such as penicillin, anti-epileptics, allopurinol, tetracyclines, um, those are the main sort of drug causes, but there are many others as well. Um, other causes uh, include viral infections, such as herpes simplex virus um, and influenza, uh, bacterial infections, such as mycoplasma, uh, malignancy, um, in need of Stephen Johnson, so typically lymphoma, the known association, um, and also graft versus host disease. Um, management of um, SJF and TEN is supported usually. I mean, it's usually in a, a high dependency unit or, or intensive care. So they're usually pretty unwell um, and they need a regular nursing care. Um, so take an A to E approach with all these patients, fluid resuscitate, um, and uh, again, you want to uh, withdraw, withdraw all the drugs started in the past four weeks. So you're not going to be necessarily sure exactly as to what triggered it. Careful fluid balance is really important here because you don't want to overload them by giving them too much fluid either. So careful monitoring of, of input and output is key. Um, this is a painful condition, so analgesia is also important. Um, and like with erythroderma, as you're losing a lot of your skin barrier, 50-50 ointment, so white soft paraffin, um, is really important to coat the patient with it. So that will be um, one, of the, one of the life saving treatments here. Um, just a quick note about steroids and intravenous immunoglobulins. Um, they can be used as uh, a part of the management for, for SJS and TEN, but the evidence is controversial behind it. Um, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Um, and you know, um, I'm just going to you know, leave it at that, but, but be aware that they can be used in, in uh, immunoglobulins. Um, we're just looking at a few questions here. Uh, what were the drugs that could cause SJS? Um, so I'll just go through them again. So drug causes of SJS and TEN are typically sulfonamides, uh, the trimethoprim and um, um anti-epileptics, uh, allopurinol, tetracyclines, um, penicillins, um, and uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Um, do we give antibiotics in Stevens Johnson as well? Um, good question. Um, again, it, it depends clinically if we suspect infection. So again, you're not going to be wrong for starting a broad spectrum antibiotics to cover from for any uh, any suspected infection. These patients are typically going to be sick, so a lot, a lot of them will have antibiotics at some point, um, and they are at increased risk of getting. Uh, uh, superimposed skin infections because they've lost this protective barrier um, as, as the skin peels away. Um, so, uh, um, so you don't always give antibiotics, but, but um, uh, it's a safe bet when the patients are very unwell, and definitely if there's signs of superimposed skin infection or signs of sepsis. Right, so uh, let's move on to the next question, guys. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Okay. Okay, so excellent guys. Yeah. Um like and famous. Um, this is the correct answer. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about, about these options here before we move on actually. Um, so this is a classical 
case for life in Thanos. A um, number of clues, you remember the, the six keys, um, peritic, it's purple, uh, there are plaques, it's got a typical location as well, palmer aspects of the wrist, a very common place for the life in Thanos. Um, and these lacy white lines are all typical of, of this, uh, this uh, condition. Chronic plaque psoriasis doesn't typically cause a burning sensation in the mouth. It usually affects the stents of surfaces. Um, and you normally get a, a silvery scale rather than these lacy white lines. Um, lichen sclerosis, um, it's a chronic inflammatory disease typically affecting the genital skin. Um, Common is probably in, in postmenopausal women, um, though it can affect men too. Um, these present with um, a white, crinkled, or, or thickened patches of genital skin with associated itch, um, pain, uh, and sometimes dyspareunia as well, so painful intercourse. Um, lichen simplex chronicus. Um, so this is where a localized area of skin becomes thickened and leathery. Um, the terms of that is lichenification. Um, and this is due to chronic rubbing. Uh, and this may be a sort of stress-related habit. Um, and it typically affects the, the calves, the back of the neck, um, as well as the genitals as well. Pemphigus is a blistering condition, which we'll talk a bit about later, actually. Um, and although there is uh, mucosal involvement often with pemphigus, um, on the skin you typically find these flaccid blisters um, and painful erosions, which, which aren't, aren't mentioned here. Um, and typically these patients are a little bit more unwell, whereas our 28-year-old patient here has strolled into his GP. So what is like a pain is it's a, a chronic inflammatory skin condition. Um, six P's are a helpful way to remember it. And we confuse these obviously with the six P's of, a, of an ischemic limb. Uh, that also will raise some eyebrows in dermatology clinic if you start describing it as perishing cold and all of that. But purple, pruritic, polygonal, so multiple sides to the, to the lesions, planar, so flat tops, uh, and papules and plaques. Um, Wiccan Strier um, describes this lacy white appearance on, on top of the lesions, and this can be present in the, in the oral mucosa as well. Um, and um, part of any dermatological examination is also infecting inside the mouth, so it should be an area you will check as well. Um, Lichen penis is usually self limiting, but um, if it persists or it's particularly itchy and symptomatic, you can use uh, topical steroids. And typically, you would go for a potent or very potent topical steroids, um, which will clear it up nicely. Um, so, is lichen simplex chronicus more common in those with eczema, or is that just general lichenification? So, lichen simplex chronicus is Specific, um, a, a specific cause of lichenification, so to speak, so chronic rubbing in a certain area. But you do get thickened skin um, in various other, other conditions, there are many, um, which can be um, an endogenous cause, so the actual illness itself is causing the thickened skin rather than just the rubbing. Um, um, can you go over lichen sclerosis a bit? It was just a bit too fast. Absolutely. Um, so lichen sclerosis, um, again, it's inflammatory. Um, it's a common exam question, so you know, high yield stuff. Um, it, it typically affects the genitals. That's the main, the main feature, really. Um, and it's commonest in postmenopausal women because it's linked with a reduction in estrogen. Um, it can affect men too, particularly if they are uncircumcised. Um, and the way uh, lichen sclerosis presents is with this white, thickened, crinkled patches of skin around the genitals. Um, and, and you can get some atrophy uh, of the vulva in those areas as well. Um, and the symptoms it presents with are itch, and it can sometimes be painful or sore. Um, and sometimes you might have a patient complaining, oh, it's got some in my, uh, it's painful when I have sex. Um, and that might prompt you to think of, of lichen sclerosis. So I hope that, hope that was. Um, lichen planus, can it be pre-malignant? Um, as far as I know, um, I don't think so. This is a simple answer. I, I could be wrong, but um, it's, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think so. Um, if he has this in his mouth, what can you do? Oh, great question. Great question. Um, I mean, 
Hmm, good, good one. I'm not sure actually. Um, I wonder if there are um, sort of buccal steroid applications that you could potentially apply. Um, I'm guessing here. I'm not actually sure of this answer. Um, so to do do look that up. Uh, do look that up afterwards. Um, is there a mouthwash? Yeah, I'm not sure, but um, I don't think there's a steroid mouthwash. But there, I think maybe there are topical applications you can apply. Okay, so let's move on. Um, this is just a couple of pictures I wanted to see. Uh, on the left, this is characteristic lichen planus as described helpfully in our question that we had, the FDA question. So again, you can see these violaceous purple uh, rashes on both palm aspects of the wrist. Um, they'll be very itchy uh, and they're polygonal. You can see angulated ridges to the, to the rash. Um, and this is real classic lichen planus. And these um, uh, these lines on the right in the patient's mouth are Wickham's strelae, these lacy white lines that you can see. So let's move on to the next question. So I hope this is helpful, guys. And if I'm speaking too quickly, or or you have any queries, please keep posting them. It's all, all good. Okay, 15 seconds. Five seconds. Okay. Right, excellent. So the majority of people um, have got this correct. So Pemphigus vulgaris, and, and some of you have put Spurless Pemphigoid. Um, so let's. Um, Let's dissect this um, a little bit. So, firstly, the only condition here that has IgG deposition within the epidermis is pemphigus vulgaris. And then it's a little bit niche, but um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, about this in a moment. Um, uh, Bullus pemphigoid is also uh, an autoimmune blistering condition with IgG deposition in the skin. However, this is in a different place in the skin. This is at the dermoepidermal junction. So the basement membrane. You remember the layers of the skin at the top, you've got the epidermis, um, and then beneath this, you've got the basement membrane, and then beneath that basement membrane, you have the dermis, and underneath that, stuff, underneath that. So, so the basement membrane essentially joins the epidermis with the dermis. So, um, pemphigoid gestationis, um, uh, essentially, this, this is also an autoimmune blistering disease, uh, and it's quite rare. Um, and usually, uh, obviously, given the name, it occurs in pregnancy, usually the second and third trimester. Um, it's also IgG mediated, um, but these antibodies attack the basement membrane in the skin, much like bullous pemphigoid. Um, and typically, the abdomen is the main site of disease, um, spreading down to the trunk and limbs. Um, Staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, we've talked a little bit about already, and um, it usually presents in neonates and young children. Um, it can also present in adults who've got renal failure um, and, uh, and if they are immunosuppressed. So patients will usually have a sort of an area of yellow superficial crust or, or impetigo. Um, this is caused by the staph, which is a commensal skin organism. Um, and then this tends to release, um, the staph releases these epidermolytic toxins into the bloodstream, which then causes widespread erythema and blistering. Um, dermatitis herpetiformis, lastly, um, this is uncommon in practice, I don't, I've rarely seen it, but it's super common in exams, um, so do learn about it. Um, it's essentially associated with um, a gluten-sensitive enteropathy, such as celiac disease, most commonly. Um, so the rash is itchy um, and usually associated with symptoms suggested of celiac disease, so you might get a case of you know, a young woman coming in with irritable bowels, diarrhea, uh, fatigue, maybe some weight loss. Um, and the key feature here is that the immunofluorescence shows IgA deposition. 
to all these other ones. So Buddhist pentagoid, pentagoid gestation is the pentagus vulgaris, IgG, dermatitis hepatiformis is IgA, and staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome is not an autoimmune, but rather the staph releases these toxins into the bloodstream. That's where the pathology comes from. Um, so, blistering conditions, pemphigus and pemphigoid, really, really important. Uh, you might see them on, uh, on the acute medical unit or, or a &E or in the GP. Um, so, bullet pemphigoid, um, as I mentioned, you get deposition of this IgG on the basement membrane of the epidermis. Um, and you can see this immunofluorescent picture on the right here. And you can see this lovely fluorescent band of IgG deposition, um, sort of in the middle of the, of the skin section. Above that, uh, that band, you've got the epidermis, um, the fluorescent band itself is the basement membrane, um, which is where the IgG deposits, um, and beneath that you've got the dermis. And um, the IgG affects the hemidesmosomes um, between the epidermis and the dermis. And hemidesmosomes are structures that ensure that the epidermal um, skin cells, the keratinocytes, ensure that they stick to the dermis to make a tight seal. And when the seal is disrupted through this autoimmune process, that's when you get these blisters. Um, and with bullet pentagoid, um, because the um, site of where the IgG is deposited is a bit lower down in the skin, you get these um, deeper, tense blisters or bullies. Um, and I'll show you a picture of those on the next slide. Um, but the key feature of bullet pentagoid, bullet pentagoid is deep, tense blisters. Um, it rarely affects the oral mucosa. Um, diagnosis, you want to take a skin biopsy and send it off for immunofluorescence. Um, and with pemphigus vulgaris, um, it's a bit different. So you get deposition of IgG within the epidermis, so the top layer, um, and this binds to desmosomes. So desmosomes help stick the keratinocytes together in that epidermal layer. Um, and again, uh, when, when these are disrupted, um, it fills with fluid in that area, and then you get these fragile, superficial blisters and erosions on the skin. Um, it does, Pentagus vulgaris does affect oral mucosa. Um, and again, it exhibits the Nikolsky signs, the sloughing, easy sloughing up of the skin with just light pressure. Diagnosis is much like bullet pentagoid. You can take a skin biopsy and send it off for immunofluorescence. And you typically, with uh, bullet pentagoid, favor topical steroids with less severe and Pentagus vulgaris more severe, so you want to use oral steroids. And um, it's a helpful little way of remembering that down at the bottom of the slide. I want to have a look at some of these questions before we move on. Um, so does the mucosal involvement in the mouth affect swallowing? Um, absolutely. So the temporary vulgaris, when you get these oral alterations, it can be very, very painful. Um, so typically patients, they might not be able to eat properly. Um, so you must think carefully about nutrition. Um, you might think about liquid diet, things like that. Um, um, so certainly it does affect swallowing. Um, obviously, when it, it, swallow is ever affected in your patient, do get the speech and language team involved. Uh, multidisciplinary care and medicine is always a very good way forward. Um, how do you treat oral lichen planus? I think that's from a bit earlier, so we'll, we'll skip that now, but we can come back to that a bit later on um, after the session. So what is the biopsy finding in bullet pentagon again? So in Bullet pentagoid, um, you get um, IgG deposition on the basement membrane, whereas in pemphigus vulgaris, you get it within the epidermis. Um, and the antibody deposited in bullet pentagoid um, is IgG. Uh, sorry, I missed it. Did you say pemphigus is more severe than bullet? Hence, you use oral steroids. Absolutely. So, pemphigus vulgaris is typically more severe. Um, hence, you do use uh, systemic treatment. Uh, but just in the interest of time, I'm just going to move on to the next slide. Um, here's a couple of pictures. Um, on the left, we've got bullet pentagoids. So you can see these lovely, um, tense blisters filled with fluid, also known as bullies, hence the name bullet pentagoids. So a few of them there. Whereas on the right, um, pentagoids vulgaris, you've got these erosions on the, on this uh, patient's trunk, um, these eroded layers of skin. Um, and these are flaccid blisters. Um, so, so this is a key difference be between the two. Um, so if you're shown a picture um, in an exam or in a patient, you should be able to tell the difference pretty well just by clinical examination. So 
So next question, guys. Twenty seconds. Ten seconds. Okay, so most people have put option D. Um, the correct answer is actually herpes simplex virus, um, so option E. Um, and uh, you know, this is, this is a tough question, so I completely understand why most, most people put D. Um, and well done to those who got herpes simplex. So um, let's go through it a bit. Um, it's a tough question. Um, let's look through the question itself. Um, we've got uh, a 13, a young girl um, who's got this rash on her face, getting worse. But three weeks ago, with these red, dry, itchy patches. So, what does this make you think of? Red, dry, and it's itchy. This makes you think of eczema, um, and probably predominantly affecting her cheeks. Um, and then, of course, recently the rash has then become worse. The patient's got more unwell. It's febrile with a temperature of 38, you know, pretty sick. Um, and we've got these monomorphic vesicles on the cheeks and around the mouth. The monomorphic just means that all the lesions look the same. Um, and, and some ulceration there. And a key thing, which I'm sure what drew most of you towards staff, is this yellow crust. The yellow crust. So yellow crust absolutely can be a feature of staff. Um, so the key to this question is just knowing a little bit about the course of each of these illnesses and some of the characteristic features. So strep pyogenes, um, this is the cause of scarlet fever um, as well as strep throat. Strep throat. And the course of the illness is a bit different to this scenario. So the patient will start with a, a sudden fever, malaise, sore throat, and the key thing is a strawberry tongue, a swollen strawberry tongue. That's a classic uh, appearance of, of the patient's tongue. Um, and the rash is usually erythematous, as the name suggests, and usually quite extensive. So it affects the limbs and the torso as well, more so than the face, although the face can look a bit flushed. And the illness usually lasts around a week or so. So this rash here in our question has lasted for three weeks and still getting worse. Um, Varicella zoster, we all know as chickenpox in children, highly contagious uh, infection spread by mucosal droplets. Patients infectious from two days before, five days after the onset of the rash. Presents with flu-like symptoms. It's an itchy maculopapular rash, so macules are flat small lesions and papules are, are small raised dome-like pimply lesions um, and then these progress to vesicles um, and these usually heal, with, heal within approximately 16 days or so. So again, not the same sort of duration as the here. Um, and interestingly, the virus can lie dormant in the dorsal root ganglions, um, which can lead later to shingles. Um, and Yezen, I'm sure, you know, he's a budding neurologist, I'm a budding dermatologist and, and shingles will excite both of us, which is, which is always nice. Um, parvovirus B19, this is also known as erythema infectiosum, infectiosum, fifth disease or slapped cheek. And it begins with bright red cheeks um, and these just tend to um, fade after a few days. And the patients are usually, the children, sorry, they're usually more well than in this case. They don't typically get high fever and, uh, and, and unwellness usually resolved in a few days. So Staph aureus, um, this can cause a yellow gold crusted appearance. This is called impetigo. This can sort of be around the face. It can be on the top of the, uh, on top of the scalp, known as cradle cap. Um, and it could be present here as well. Um, so this definitely would be on your differential in the real world. Um, so 
the key here is that you've got a background of eczema. You've got this red, dry, itchy patches on, on the patient's skin, and then this um, worsening to this uh, vesicular uh, unwell, uh, this vesicular uh, rash. And this is more in keeping with something called uh, eczema herpetica, which I'll come on to shortly. Um, but this causes this, um, uh, these, these, these vesicles and the yellow crust more so than staph would. And that's why herpes simplex is the most likely cause um, of this deterioration of this child's eczema. Does that, does that make sense, guys? So you do get this gold crust in both, um, but because of the presentation on the background of eczema, um, and these vesicles, herpes simplex is, is favored over staph aureus. Um, so I'm just going to move on. Atopic dermatitis, um, so the underlying cause of this um, patient's illness. Um, I'll briefly talk about dermatitis, atopic dermatitis or eczema because it's a big, it's a big topic and It'll be difficult to cover everything properly in, in this session. So do read about it in more detail. In particular, go over contact dermatitis and allergic to contact dermatitis, irritant dermatitis, and also seborrheic dermatitis. These are all important to know about. So do, do read that. In but atopic dermatitis, super common. It's dry skin. Everything is dry, dry, dry. Um, it's associated with asthma and hay fever or allergic rhinitis. Um, and it's very, very itchy. So typically you get patients scratching at their skin certainly get superimposed uh, bacterial infection uh, with these excoriations. Um, it's usually kind of poorly demarcated like in this picture here, Un unlike something like psoriasis, which is, or, or like infamous, which is well demarcated. Um, and typically it affects the flexural sites. Um, so so the, um, everyone flexes their arms, the inner part of the, the biceps, um, the back of the knees, those kind of areas. Um, investigations, so if you're looking, if it looks like there's superimposed infection, um, you can consider doing some skin swabs. Um, uh, I think you can consider also patch testing to rule out um, allergic contact dermatitis. And this is uh, particularly useful if you've got a patient that's got predominantly hand dermatitis, because it could be like they go to work and they're mixing their hands in chemicals and, or they're a builder and the kind of stuff they're using is keeps triggering off their eczema. And then you want to do patch testing. Um, does everyone know what, what patch testing is? Does anyone want to explain that? Okay, well, we can come back to it later if anyone wants to find out more about that. Um, treatment of atopic dermatitis. So um, avoid the irritants, um, soap substitutes. Um, you'll, you'll all have dermal 500 on the tip of your tongue. Um, emollients, a dip of base, lather it on two, three, four times a day. Um, patients typically under apply um, emollients, which encourage copious amounts. Um, antihistamines can be really important, especially with the itch. Um, and at night times, patients typically tend to scratch more in their sleep and wake up with these scratches unintentionally. So you can give a sedating antihistamine at night time. For example, hydroxyzine is a good one. Topical steroids are really important. Um, you can use the Hebdo rule, so hydrocortisone, humivate, betmivate, dermivate, and then all steroids and escalate depending on the severity of the eczema. Um, but be aware of the side effects of topical steroids, including skin thinning. Um, topical steroid sparing agents, agents may be used, firstly, if you're getting lots of side effects from the topical steroids, or if you're looking at um, uh, sort of delicate areas around the face. So the eyelids, if someone's got eczema on the eyelids, you, you don't want to thin the eyelids out anymore because they're already really thin areas of skin. So then you might use something like tacrolimus, which is a steroid sparing agent. Oral steroids, you might think about if you've got quite extensive refractory eczema. Um, and finally, um, you can use phototherapy and biologics as well. There's a, a new biologic um, that we use called Gupilumab, um, which has really good, um, really good effect. Look at some of the questions. Um, so hebdo, um, so H is so this is to help every budding dermatologist. Um, hydrocortisone, humivate, betnovate, and dermivate, and that's just in an escalating order of potency. Um, all right, so let's move on a little bit. Um, complications of atopic dermatitis. 
um, eczema herpetica than we've talked about. And this is a really nice picture of eczema herpetica, much like the description in the SBA question. So here you can see these monomorphic vesicles with a little bit of the yellow crusting, you can see a little bit there, um, and a bit of um, red dry skin on the background, indicating an underlying eczema. And so this is really classic of eczema herpeticum, and um, this is the kind of, it, it does look a little bit different to um, a staph infection, where you might get a, a little yellow crust, but it's more predominantly the yellow crust and less so all these vesicles. So this is eczema herpeticum on the right. Um, you can get erythroderma as a complication of atopic dermatitis, um, as was one of the previous FDAs. Um, and just be aware again of the topical steroid effects, such as skin. Um, I won't dwell too much on this slide, but this is just you know, what the current NICE criteria is for diagnosing atopic dermatitis. Um, so the patient needs to have itchy skin plus three or more of the following. So um, do, do learn this. Um, at some point after the session. Um, so what are the topical steroid effects? Um, so there are many. Um, the main thing for topical steroids um, is skin thinning, especially with longer courses. Um, and then um, you'll all know uh, some of the complications of all steroids, such as uh, Cushing's disease or adrenal uh, suppression and things like when you stop steroids, you get rebound, ozonium, chitin, things like that. So topical steroids typically don't have so much of these systemic effects, but certainly dermavate or stronger steroids, the longer courses, can have systemic absorption, um, and they can definitely lead to, to some of these um, uh, systemic symptoms. So I've had patients who have had severe psoriasis and eczema who have lots and lots of topical steroids, and then we'll see them in clinic, and they're you know, they've got all the classic features of Cushing disease, you know, that, that sort of orange on a stick appearance with the, um, you know, the abdominal striae and the buffalo hump, all the classic signs, just because of topical steroids. Um, so you do need to be um, sparing in their use. And the key thing is always arrange follow-up. So if you start someone on topical steroids, ask to see them back in, in a few weeks' time. Um, if, you know, if you go down the GP route, you're seeing them in, in the GP setting. Or, um, ask for someone to review um, review the markets just to ensure that, that they're all right. So, um, next question. Fifteen seconds. Five seconds. Okay. Well done. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, correct answer is um, C: topical benzyl peroxide. Um, so firstly, let's just spare a moment. So, you know, give some credit to our patient here. He's really kindly styled his hair in such a way that we can see the underlying pathology. Um, so that's, that's really nice. Um, so um, this is a case of mild to moderate acne, I'd say. Um, you can see some comedones, papules, um, pustules, um, and these, you know, there's a combination of, of non-inflammatory and inflammatory acne. We'll come on to come on to that in a, in a moment. So as this is on the milder spectrum of acne, um, we want to start with topical agents first. So that rules out um, the oral options, um, and and also if, if topical corticosteroids aren't used in acne, um, so that option is out. So you're left with kind of uh, benzoyl peroxide and then vitamin A analogs, which are both used um, early on in acne treatment. So topical. Benzyl peroxide is favoured here because it has 
um, both comedolytic properties, so it reduces the number of comedones, um, as, as well as antiseptic and anti-inflammatory properties. Whereas vitamin A analogues, such as adapalene, um, these are better at treating acne, which is primarily comedones, so fewer of these sort of red, angry, inflammatory um, pustules and papules. So you're all absolutely right, I've got most of you that ends up what side of the um, so what is acne? It's, a, it's an inflammatory skin condition. It's um, essentially a disorder of the pilosebaceous unit, comprising the hair shaft, the hair follicle, the sebaceous glands, which secretes the oily sebum, um, and the erector pili muscle, which causes the, the hairs to stand up on the back of your neck when the beloved person comes and walks in the room. We've all had that. Um, so what's the pathogenesis of acne? Um, it's essentially caused by dead skin cells sticking together in clumps in the hair follicle due to an overproduction of, of keratin. And these clumps mix thin with the oily sebum um, produced by the sebaceous glands, which is driven by androgens, so testosterone, dihydrotestosterone. Um, and this causes a blockage forming, um, forming a comedone, um, which is a sort of lump, um, a lump on the skin. And you can see a few here uh, uh, in the picture. Um, so, you can have open comedones and closed comedones. So, typically, an open comedone is also known as a blackhead, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, and closed comedones is where you get this full blockage of the hair follicle, um, and this um, leads to whiteheads. And you can see a few of these little whiteheads um, on this patient on the right. Um, you get this. Uh, when you get this blockage forming in the hair follicle, this is like a breeding ground for your skin commensal organisms. So typically, Chlorophyllum, Bacterium acnes, or P acnes. And actually, recently, um, I found out, have been renamed to Cutie Bacterium acnes, but let's not dwell too much on that. So, P acnes. Um, so, acne um, can be classified as mild, moderate, and severe. In mild acne, you have primarily comedones, so non inflammatory lesions. In moderate acne, you get these pustules and inflammation and inflammatory lesions. And in severe acne, you get lots of inflammatory lesions, but you can also get these large nodules and these cysts forming in the skin. And often you can get a lot of scarring present. And we also must remember the psychosocial or psychological effects that acne can have on patients. It can really uh, destroy the patient's self esteem if it's not treated appropriately. Um, so let's talk about the treatments. Um, you start with, in mild acne, you start with topical treatments, either ointments and creams such as retinoids um, and also benzyl peroxide. Um, you can combine these together sometimes with something called epiduo. Um, and then you can add in, if that's not working, you can add in a topical antibiotic such as clindamycin. I'd avoid using something like erythromycin because there's lots of antibiotic resistance to that now. Um, then you can move on to oral antibiotics. For example, lymocytine. And you want to continue these for about three months. And a really key, th a key thing to remember is when you start somebody on oral antibiotics for acne, you must continue on their topical retinoids and benzoyl peroxide. So you can stop the topical antibiotics, but you need to continue the, um, the non antibiotic topicals. Um, and this is for multiple reasons. So, number one, they have a synergistic effect. The antibiotics in a kill the bacteria. Um, and the retinoids and the benzoyl peroxide have their own separate um, anti-inflammatory and, uh, and other effects on the acne. So together they work synergistically, so it leads to much better outcomes. And the second reason is um, using antibiotics promotes antibiotic resistance. A way to combat that is by using these retinoids and the benzoyl peroxide alongside the antibiotics. So really important. Remember, retinoids, vitamin A derivatives, these are teratogenic, so avoid those in pregnancy. Um, you can consider the combined oral contraceptive pill in women, um, such as uh, the pill called Dianet, it's particularly useful. Um, and really, this is especially useful um, when you have acne um, that's caused by uh, an underlying endocrinological problem, for example, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS. And Dianet can be really helpful there. Finally, when all else fails, you can use the magic bullet uh, isotretinoin, commonly known as roaccutane or acutane. Um, this really is a, a powerful uh, ex 
excellent treatment for acne and with really excellent response rates. Um, but it does have a number of side effects that you need to be aware of. Aware of. Number one, as it is a vitamin A derivative, um, you want to exclude pregnancy. Um, I'm just trying to remember how long the patient needs to be off Roaccutane before they can conceive again. I think it's about six months, um, but do, do check that um, in a textbook or online um, to exclude pregnancy. Um, and the most common side effects with isotretinoin is that it dries everything out. You get dry skin, dry lips, dry nostrils, dry eyes, everything is dry. Rarely, it can cause depression. Um, there's been some, some links about it with suicidal ideation as well. Um, you can get deranged LFT, um, and as I said, contraindicated in pregnancy. Um, so, just a few questions. Um, so, according to NICE, uh, first line treatment of mild to moderate acne is with a topical treatment such as a retinoid with or without benzoyl peroxide as an adjunct. So it isn't retinoid or vitamin A analog. Yeah, so good point. So it's a very it's tr a tricky one, to be honest, because um, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, usually you would start retinoids um, alongside benzoyl peroxide. In that SDA question, um, when you have to choose between the two, if you've got a tendency towards um, an inflammatory, like a, a moderate acne with lots of pustules and red looking angry spots, then you might favor benzoyl peroxide over the retinoid because the retinoid is better for these comedones, the kind of flat, um, non angry looking lesions, the bumps that you get in acne. So that's why. But I, I totally appreciate your point. It, it is a bit confusing. Um, there's a website called the Primary Care Dermatology Society. I'll mention this again at the end if I remember. Primary Care Dermatology Society. And this has a really good um, uh, systematic way of. of and tackling acne management. And there it specifically says that the first line is very mild acne, it's a retinoid. But then when you start getting these um, inflammatory papules and pustules and stuff, then you use benzoyl peroxide. Um, did you say open comedones is a whitehead? Absolutely. Yes, yes it is. Um, what is adapalene? So adapalene is a topical uh, retinoid. Um, and it's a vitamin A derivative. Um, so you use that in uh, mild to moderate acne. Um, how do benzoyl peroxide and retinoids work in acne? Great question. Um, ooh, mm, mm, just trying to remember. Um, so I think essentially retinoids, um, retinoids have um, um, anti, they essentially break down or help um, reduce the comedones in acne, you know, the comedolytic property. Um, whereas benzoyl peroxide, um, it, it sort of does that as well, but it also has more antiseptic and anti-inflammatory properties, essentially. But do um, look that up afterwards. Um, so all retinoids are not used in pregnancy, but topical retinoids are safe. So, um, so no. So all retinoids and topical retinoids, um, you need to avoid both of them in pregnancy. Okay? So any retinoids, just don't use it. I think, I think with topical retinoids, you can breastfeed, but again, just double check that uh, yourself. I'll, I'll need to check that myself afterwards. Um, I'm gonna, there's quite a lot of questions. I'm gonna, in the interest of time, um, just move on um, to, to the next question. That's all right. We've still got a, a couple, we've got three more questions and they're associated with topics, right? Right, so here's the next question. Um, Fifteen seconds left. Five seconds. Okay. All 
Alrighty, so very good, everyone. Yeah, absolutely. So the right answer is uh, certainly option A, a basal cell carcinoma. And so we see here uh, on the patient on the left ailer of this patient's nose, um, a sort of nodule, um, a sort of central depression uh, or ulceration with raised edges and this pearlescent sheen, um, classical of a basal cell carcinoma. And given its asymptomatic, um, slow growing dilution, um, directed towards a basal cell rather than a squamous cell. Um, with, with squamous cell carcinomas, you, you typically get uh, more crusting or scale, and um, um, they're often a bit more symptomatic or some tenderness or, or bleeding. Um, Coretto acanthomas are related to squamous cells, um, but the key feature with those are that they are fast growing, um, so less than six weeks. All right, so that's a key feature. I mean, they can look a bit like squamous cells. Um, Bowen's disease um, is a pre-malignant condition, also known as squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Um, and this forms a well-defined um, erythematous scaly plaque uh, on the skin. And it doesn't, it does not typically have these raised edges like, like a BCC does. Um, and finally, seborrheic keratoses. Uh, these are common um, benign warty growths, which I'm sure you've all seen usually light or dark brown in appearance, and sometimes patients have many of them, um, and they're usually very well demarcated and have a stuck on appearance, and they don't usually cause any symptoms or, or ulcerate. Um, a bit about BCCs, uh, very common, 30% lifetime risk, uh, probably the most common cancer in general. Um, a pearlescent pearly sheen um, is classical um, with rolled edges, um, and telangiectasia, these small blood vessels that you can especially appreciate when you look under a dermatoscope. Risk factors include older age, fair skin, um, previous UV damage, and immunosuppression. Um, management, uh, the mainstay, um, you want to excise the season and send it to the pathologists, and usually you want to have about four millimeter margins around. You can use curettage and cautery. Um, and sometimes you might consider using radiotherapy, and this would typically be used if surgery is not, is not really suitable. Um, imiquimod um, is, a, is a, a topical immune response modifier, um, and this is more commonly used in superficial BCCs and ones that are smaller, so less than two centimeters in diameter. Um, and cryotherapy, um, they are basically used in superficial BCCs as well, where you use liquid nitrogen to freeze, uh, freeze off the lesion. That can be very fun. Um, for BCCs, um, as well as squamous cell carcinomas, um, in delicate areas, um, and by that I mean around the lips, um, around the nose, and around the eyes in particular, um, or the ears as well, um, you use something called Mohs micrographic surgery. Um, and this is a really specialized type of surgery where the dermatologist is um, specially, specially trained in skin surgery, um, as well as they act as the, uh, the pathologist. So what happens is the patient will come in with their, their lesion around their nose, for example. They will you'll inject local anesthetic, um, and then the dermatologist will excise the BCC. Um, and then in the next room, um, they will look under the microscope um, at this lesion um, and look for any skin cancer cells all the way around the lesion. If there are any remaining uh, parts of, if there are any remaining skin cancer cells on the season, uh, on the edges, then we can go back to the patient and then excise a little bit more and a little bit more and keep repeating this process until there's, you're sure that there's no skin cancer cells uh, left on the patient. Um, so this can be quite time consuming, but um, it, it leads to the best cure rates for BCCs and SBCs. And, um, once you've left that big defect in the patient's face, then you, uh, your next job is to uh, surgically repair it in the most cosmetically, uh, the best cosmetic way possible. And so that can be really fun. Um, BCCs are almost never metastatic, um, but they can locally infiltrate, especially if they're left for a bit too long. Um, so to have a quick look at some of these questions, um, she wants to know how many more slides. There's just two more questions after this. Um, so it shouldn't be too much longer. So thank you all for your continued attention. Um, I thought that closed comedones are whiteheads and open comedones are blackheads. Um, no. Uh, 
Oh, you're having me to second guess myself. Um, let me look that up and I will, uh, at the end of the session, I will clarify that once and for all. Um, but um, actually, I think you're right, actually. Um, open comedones are blackheads, actually. And closed comedones, because you get the closing off at the top, are, are whiteheads. Um, all right, so anyway, I'll come back to that. I'll clarify that again at the end. Next question, everyone. And we've got just one more after this. Twenty seconds. Ten seconds. Five. All right, so Option D, absolutely, squamous cell carcinoma is correct. Well done, it's really, really good. Um, so, um, essentially, squamous cell carcinomas, um, they are a malignancy of the epidermal keratinocytes, which produce keratin. And you typically get this um, indurated um, nodular appearance um, with a crusted tumor, as you can see in, in this picture. Lots of crust, lots of um, uh, scale. Um, and it can ulcerate, um, just like in that, in that picture. Um, and it can be sore, tender, and they can bleed. And they're mostly caused by excessive UV, UV exposure, just like for most skin cancers, um, and you get the result of some DNA damage, which precipitates um, certain cell carcinoma. Um, you commonly um, get SCC um, in immunosuppressed patients. Um, so, for example, you might have a patient that's had a renal transplant and they're on some, some immunosuppressive medication. Um, and then these patients can develop squamous cell carcinomas. So these patients get followed up in a, in a specific clinic um, to, to uh, monitor their skin. Squamous cell carcinomas can metastasize. Um, so that's something to, to definitely be aware of. Um, and there's a spectrum of disease with squamous cell carcinomas. So it starts with actinic keratosis, which is these small scales resulting, in, uh, resulting from sun damage. Um, so typically a lot of older patients who you know, have spent a lot of their life in the sun, they'll have lots of these little crusty scaly lesions, these are actinic keratoses. Bowen's disease we mentioned before, that's more of that flat patch, that well circumscribed patch, and that's squamous cell carcinoma in situ, it's pre-malignant, so it can develop into SCT, um, and then you have squamous cell carcinoma. Um, investigation and treatment is much the same as BCC, um, so cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. You want to take a biopsy, send it to the lab, confirm the diagnosis um, and treatment uh, for, for BCCs. You can use Mohs micropathic surgery also for squamous cells. Um, just one quick note there, you don't typically use Mohs surgery, well you don't at all, for melanomas. Um, and the reason for that I believe is uh, with melanomas, when you excise a melanoma and then you try to do all the clever microscopy stuff, and it damages the, um, the tissue that you have, so you can't reliably see the melanocytes, whereas this doesn't happen in BCCs and squamous cells. The MOS, the BCC, and the SCC, but not the melanoma. Overall mortality is pretty good if you've got just a localized cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, but the five year survival um, reduces quite, quite a lot when you have metastatic disease. All right. Um, last question, guys.
sorry about that, 10 seconds left. And five more. Okay, excellent. So yeah, the majority of you have got the correct answer A, absolutely. Sentinel, no biopsy. Uh, some of you have put D, adjuvant radiotherapy. So let's um, talk about it a little bit. So the key here is we've got a confirmed melanoma uh, with a two millimeter thickness, which is a medium sort of thickness. And you now want to see if the melanoma has spread to the lymph nodes. Um, reviewing this patient in six months time, Sadly, that's probably going to take place in the mortuary um, because, you know, that's just a bit too long time to wait and it can metastasize in that time. So you really want to act much more quickly than that. Um, adjuvant radiotherapy, um, as well as chemotherapy, they're both premature in this case because what you want to do is once you diagnose the melanoma, is you want to stage it. Um, so staging involves um, uh, sending off the biopsy, getting the breast thickness as part of it, and then you want to check if there's local invasion of lymph nodes, and that's with a sentinel node biopsy. Um, lymphadenectomy, um, again, that might be indicated, but only after you've done the sentinel node biopsy. Um, so I just want everyone to quickly, before we go into the management of melanoma, just really ingrain this image in your mind. Um, um, this is uh, essentially an asymmetrical mole, um, poorly defined borders, regular. Um, there's areas of light and dark, dark brown. Um, there's patches of sort of pinkish skin color in the middle. And this is really worrying for a malignant melanoma. So melanoma is an invasive malignant tumor of melanocytes. It comprises about 4% of skin cancers. The DCCs is about 70% or so, and squamous cells about 25%, um, and melanoma is about 4%, very roughly. Um, risk factors um, include increasing age. Um, if you've had a previous melanoma, um, you're at risk of getting another one. If a patient has um, numerous moles all over their body, there are increased risks of one of them uh, sort of becoming atypical and developing into a melanoma. Family history is really important to so always ask if anyone in their family has had um, any melanomas or other skin cancers. If they've been sunburnt a lot, um, that's a risk factor for any skin cancer. Um, and finally, immunosuppression is another important risk factor. Um, they can occur anywhere on the body, so not just sun exposed sites. Um, and it's usually melanomas are described according to their appearance, and there are a few, a few different types. So you've got lentigo malignas. Um, and superficial melanomas. Um, and these start as flat patches and they spread horizontally in the skin. Um, whereas nodular melanomas, um, they're, they sort of grow downwards vertically into the skin and they're a bit more infiltrative. Um, then you have these, what's called acral lentiginous melanomas. And that, I think that's um, essentially melanoma affecting the nail. Um, and here's a picture of that on the right. And you can see these nice um, streaks of black um, arising from the nail bed and growing out. And they're irregular because there's some that are sort of thicker than others and some that are thin. Um, and interestingly, Bob Marley actually died from um, an acral lentiginous um, nail melanoma. Um, so that's a, a little bit of uh, trivia there. Sometimes, um, very scarily, you can get a melanotic melanoma, so non-pigmented non melanomas. Um, so that's just something to be mindful of. Um, melanoma can, um, once it spreads to the lymph nodes, it, it can metastasize to most organs, including badly to the brain. Um, so um, after one of the questions here, after both of thickness, do you need to then re-excise with sufficient margin? So absolutely. So I'm going to come up with that um, in a moment uh, in the further management. So after you do your um, initial excision biopsy, typically you do that with small margins, so maybe two millimeters. So remember that BCC, you just go for a four millimeter margin, get it all out. With melanoma, you initially do a, a small margin two millimeters, send that off to the lab to get a few of the histological parameters that are helpful. So resolute thickness, 
um, and a few others, but mainly just the things I've already to focus on Brevio. Then, um, after you've got that information, then you go back to the patient um, and then do a wide local excision oh, uh, with sufficient margins, absolutely. So you definitely need to come back to do um, a, a wide local excision. Um, good question. So what's the difference between apical lentiginous melanoma and subungual? Um, they are the same. So it's just different terminology. Um, the main feature that differentiates lentigo maligna. Um, so lentigo maligna, uh, this is typically, um, I think I've got a picture uh, coming up. Um, I'll try and point it out. Um, but it's, um, it's much more of a flat patch um, of darkish skin. Um, at the end of this talk, I'll, I'll link you guys to a couple of really, really good websites which you can look all this stuff up and then really just have a look through all the pictures and that will really help you see the kind of obvious um, differentiations. It's much easier to just look at some pictures rather than um, uh, have descriptions of them. Um, so yeah, great. Right, so coming towards the end, guys. Um, the ATE assessment of melanoma is really important. So asymmetry. Um, so here, if we take a cross section, a line down the middle of this, of this mole, you can see it's different on the left as it is on the right. The border is irregular. A normal nevus will typically be very round and well circumscribed and um, uh, very circular. And, you know, this one is irregular, it's a winding, tortuous border. The color variation is important to so three or more colors. So here you've got dark brown, light brown, and skin color and pink. And so this is a worrying feature of the mole. Um, diameter is greater than six millimeters. So obviously, we don't have a scale here, but um, six millimeters or more um, is more worrying for a mole. But a key thing is whether it's evolving. Um, so a patient might come to you with, with what seems like a reasonably ordinary mole. You can't maybe see too much with the naked eye, but they've said it's getting a little bit bigger, it's becoming itchy, maybe it's bled a little bit. Um, that is um, very, very worrying. Um, and then you should always do a two-week wait referral for any of this kind of uh, any of these kind of moles. So um, you can send them across to the dermatology department. Um, so evolution is key. Um, so just a quick question: uh, so over what time period does melanoma evolve? Is it weeks or months? Um, so good question. I think it's quite variable. Um, there's many different types of melanoma and I think sometimes you can actually get quite rapidly growing ones, but typically I would say it's months rather than weeks um, for melanomas. Um, that's the usual time frame. But but a patient might notice, like, like especially diligent patients who look at the moles or uh, or they've got symptoms from the mole, they might just say, "Oh, I've had this mole for my whole life," um, but one week ago I noticed it, or two weeks ago I noticed it getting itchy and bigger. Um, so that can it can become a melanoma. Um, you know, uh, within, within weeks. Okay, so move on. Investigations in melanoma. Um, when you have a mole that you're worried about, you always want to look under the dermatoscope, which will magnify the lesion up to about 10 times or even 20 times. Um, photography um, is really important. So um, you can ask for medical photography of the moles, and this will just help. Um, get a detailed image um, of, the of the mole um, or the melanoma that you're worried about, um, just so you can measure it against evolution later on. Um, this is really important if you've got a, um, a, a just a normal nevus, but um, a patient's worried about it. They come in to, to the clinic. Um, we sometimes take um, photographs even of the lesion that we think is a healthy normal mole, just so they can monitor it against this picture. So even in a year's time. They can then look at this detailed photograph and say, oh, actually, yeah, it looks different to the photograph that we took a year ago, so I'll get it checked out. So photography is really important. Um, you want to do an excision biopsy, uh, as I said, two millimeter margin initially, um, and you send this to the lab, and the main thing is Breslow thickness. There are a few other histopathological markers, um, but don't worry too much about these at this stage. Um, Staging is uh, oh, just a little bit about Breslow thickness actually before I talk about staging. Um, Breslow thickness is um, a key indicator of prognosis. It is um, it measures how deep below the level of the epidermis the melanoma has infiltrated. 
Um, so a breslow thickness of less than one millimeter um, with no lymph node involvement has a five year survival of approximately 95%, so really good. But sadly, uh, once melanoma has spread uh, into the distant metastases, um, the brain mets uh, five year survival can be as low as 7%. Um, so in terms of staging, um, you can do sentinel node lymph biopsies. Um, and this is typically offered when the Breslow thickness is greater than one millimeter. Um, it's typically done simultaneously with the wide local excision. So you will have already got your Breslow thickness from the initial biopsy. You've brought the patient back for a, a wide local excision. Um, and then what you can do is you, once you've excised the lesion, you can inject a radioactive dye into that area. And this will then be traced down and down the limb. So for example, say they've got a melanoma on the arm, We'll excise it, inject some radioactive dye into that um, excision. This will be traced down the arm and then in the axilla, you can stick a, uh, a gamma probe, um, which will then start beeping um, once the radioactive dye has reached the lymph nodes in the axilla. All right, so it traces down the lymphatic system. Um, and this dye is typically a blue color. So once you get that beeping um, under the axilla, you can then perform further surgery, open it up, and then you'll see physically a blue lymph node there. And the first one that the tracer dye goes to is typically called the sentinel lymph node. Okay. Um, these lymph nodes are then excised and sent off to the lab to be examined histologically for any presence of um, melanoma in those lymph nodes. And then you can say it's, it's spread to the local lymph nodes. And then um, you might want to do a, a CT scan. Um, so you, know, you might do CT thorax, abdomen and pelvis, and then you might also include head, um, especially if you've got someone that you're considering has brain capacity. Management in melanoma. Um, prevention is key. You want to reduce sun exposure. Sunscreen is really important. Um, Two-week wait referral to dermatology uh, is, is um, the way to go. And um, there's always an MDT discussion about these melanoma patients. Um, as I mentioned, wide local excision is performed, um, and then you might consider uh, removing some of the lymph nodes if they have um, signs of melanoma there. Um, for metastatic melanoma, um, there's a few options of treatment. So you might consider chemotherapy. If the patient has brain metastases, you might use chemozolamide, um, which is a really nasty chemotherapy with lots of side effects. Um, and you might also consider something called dark harbor you can consider adjuvant radiotherapy in certain cases. Um, I know that in, when you have a solitary brain net, sometimes you can use um, gamma knife um, radiotherapy, which is where they, they, they essentially use radiotherapy um, and focus it on the tumor in the brain. And that can reduce the tumor size and lead to symptomatic improvement. Um, finally, um, targeted treatments are uh, emerging therapies in, in, in metastatic melanoma, and they can be really, really uh, useful. Um, so targeted treatments are, they work by blocking the genes involved in pathways for tumor proliferation and survival. Um, so you've got vemurafenib and dobrafenib, um, and these work on the BRAF or BRAF system, right? And so these can be really useful. Um, and finally, you've got ipilimumab, which is an immunotherapy. And immunotherapies essentially enhance the, the patient's own immune system um, so that they, so the immune system attacks the, the tumor and then it can shrink down these, um, uh, these melanoma tumors. All right. So that takes us to the end of the session, guys. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope you've all learned a lot you know, about all these fascinating dermatological conditions. Um, thank you for all your questions. I'll try to answer as many as I can, uh, as I could on the way. Um, one thing I wanted to quickly clarify, I think I mentioned, I may have mentioned earlier about these um, open and closed comedones. So I want to just clarify that open comedones are blackheads and um, closed comedones are whiteheads. So open is black, closed is white. So if I put that in the slides above, I just need to change that around. So before it's submitted, I'll run. Perfect. Thank you so much for the session, Jeff, and um, thank you everybody for attending. Please do fill out the feedback um, feedback form that I've posted in the chat.
There are loads of great prizes, including